What do you need? What do you need? Everybody. Um, we're going to get started in a few minutes here, so if you want to find a place to get settled. Um, wow. So this is amazing. Spotify. Thank you so much, Jesse and everyone at Spotify for hosting New York City Ethereum. Um, we're going to have a, a uh, event tonight discussing uh, media and the blockchain. Uh, what better place to be than Spotify for that? So first, we're going to have uh, Doug from LivePeer talk about decentralized uh, live video built on a blockchain. So go ahead, Doug. Testing. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight, and thanks, Spotify, for hosting. So do we have the presentation on the screen? Perfect. Okay, so... As Michael mentioned, I'm Doug Pitkanix. I'm one of the founders of a project called LivePeer. Um, my co-founder Eric is here, and our teammates Lucy and Janin as well. We're working on building the decentralized live streaming layer in the Web3 stack, the decentralized internet stack. So live streaming is focused on video broadcasting, audio broadcasting, data streaming. And I actually want to start out with something a little dangerous and risky, which is a live demo of live streaming. So I'm going to jump out of the presentation, kind of show you what we've built here, and jump over to the command line terminal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a live peer node. This is the same way you'd start a um, Ethereum node or a, a Bitcoin node. It's going to connect to all the different peers on the live peer network. Um, looks like Spotify's internet might be blocking me here. We'll give it one more try. Guessing it's guessing it might not work if we have to connect to a bootnet. Um, ah, that's too bad. All right, no demo for you guys. So we're gonna we're gonna cut back to the presentation and just show screenshots of live streaming in action. Basically, what I was gonna show is. You'll start a node, it'll connect to other nodes on the peer-to-peer -peer network. You can broadcast into LivePeer using any existing broadcasting tool, like OBS, um, any DAP that's built that integrates with broadcasting. Um, and then what you'll get back is you'll get back an ID. And that ID can be shared to anyone else on the LivePeer network or any hosted web player that could play it. And anyone can basically, using that ID, access your stream in a peer-to-peer -peer way, delivered by peers on the um, live peer network without trusting any centralized um, video service provider, any centralized platform like uh, Facebook or YouTube. Um, it really gives you the freedom to uh, distribute video um, using this network of infrastructure. So now we can talk a little bit about, you know, why would we do that? What's the point of decentralizing live streaming? And first of all, um, in the decentralized stack, we have layers for things like payments with Bitcoin, Ethereum. We have a layer for things like storage, like Filecoin, Swarm, IPFS. Uh, we have layers for identity, layers for naming. There's no layer for live media yet, and so if you're building a decentralized app or a DAP, and you want to include video or live audio or screen shares or streaming data, there's no infrastructure yet. And that's really what we're building. We're building the infrastructure layer to power all of that. But I'm also really excited about the applications and use cases that can be built on top of, of live video in a decentralized way with crypto payments baked in. One of the most important ones is censorship resistance in the cases of, of journalism. We take for granted all the freedom we hear, have here in the United States, but in other places, a lot of times, live media, kind of the truth of what's going on in the ground in a conflict zone or an area with greater oppression is one of the first things to be censored or cut off by the powers that be. When you do this peer-to-peer -peer in a decentralized way, you can do it in much more censorship resistant ways that are harder to, to censor and shut down. So it's really powerful. Uh, I'm also excited about embedding economics into applications to let people monetize their time, participate in the world economy 
through live internet sessions. Um, this enables things like expert networks, um, being able to monetize your time through entertainment, through education, like teaching courses, um, you know, micropayments, crypto transactions baked in for your content can be really empowering. Right now, people either have to pay centralized providers a lot to build their own services, or they have to use free providers like Facebook and YouTube that basically monetize their audience through advertising and through selling their data, and they make it hard for creators to kind of fairly be compensated for their content. Here, the power is with you, and you can build whatever you want, broadcast whatever you want. So kind of at the bottom, instead of closed, proprietary, and expensive, we believe we can enable empowerment and freedom through live streaming. There's also economic benefits that you see through token protocols. LivePeer is a crypto token protocol, and that means if you run a live peer node, if you contribute your CPU and your bandwidth to encoding and distributing video, you can earn token. And just like in Bitcoin with mining or Filecoin with providing you know, storage to the network and mining, these market protocols have a powerful economic effect. Basically, in a centralized network, there's a cost of service. And the provider has to charge you at least that cost plus a margin. In a decentralized network like this, you have the same cost of service, but because the people providing the value are earning some newly minted token by mining, essentially, the value of that can offset what they need to charge you in fees. So that can create a cheaper system at scale, which brings broadcasters, creates demand for the network, creates utility, and the competition that you see to basically compete to earn this token leads to more bandwidth, more CPU coming onto the network, costs going down for broadcasters, and it creates a flywheel, which is really powerful. Um, so even you know, existing broadcasters can benefit from a decentralized network through the, the economic opportunity. So I mentioned that you um, have an incentive to join the network and run nodes through crypto token protocol. Um, but how do we decentralize this? What are you running when you run a node? This is a look at the kind of centralized live media stack. A broadcaster sends video to a media server. It goes to a CDN to distribute it. And then it goes to a player on TVs, smartphones, laptops, et cetera. What we need to do is decentralize this. We need to take the media server, and we need it to be running on all of the nodes that join the live peer network. And we need those nodes to form a content delivery network to serve the video to millions of people who are watching. So what we've done is we've written an open source media server called LivePeer Media Server. It does all the things that we just skipped through that a media server needs to do, which can be summarized as transcoding. Taking your video, converting it into 24 different encodings, formats, and bit rates to work on all the different devices and all the different connection speeds. Because a person watching on a 4K TV in Ultra HD is seeing a different stream than the person watching on their phone on a 3G connection. And so LivePeer Media Server is running on a node. It will handle all this for you, and that's what you're basically incentivized to do. That's what you're earning token for is running this. So the problem is if all of you are running this media server on your laptop, but you're powering live streams, that's really risky because if you close your laptop, you go offline, you don't have enough bandwidth, you could interrupt someone else's stream. So I'll kind of gloss over the, the live peer protocol. We can address any questions. It's in our white paper. But the way we let everyone participate and everyone earn token is by participating in a, what's called a delegated proof of stake protocol. Candidate transcoders advertise the fees they're charging, their, the fees they're willing to share back to you for delegating, and their statistics about how well they've performed in the past. And you can basically stake or bond your tokens to delegate towards them and elect them. You say, they're going to do a great job for the network, and therefore, you will earn a nice return on this, this stake, and you elect people who will provide the best quality of service. Um, so we have a proof-of-stake protocol that lets people participate in this. And then once we know who the transcoders are going to be, the next challenge that we had to solve was to basically create the right enforcement to make sure that they're encoding your video correctly and they're not inserting any malicious content into the middle of your live stream as they're doing the work. Um, so again, we designed a protocol that can do kind of scalable verification of work on top of a protocol called TrueBit, 
I don't know if any of you have heard of TrueBit before, but it's an amazing thing you should look into. It basically lets you do off-chain computation and trust the result back on the blockchain in a decentralized, trustless way. And we built kind of a scalable solution on top of that that will let us do this at cost. Um, basically, encoders will just commit to the work that they've done once they've done their job on-chain. Some of it will get challenged. And uh, if they did it correctly, they'll receive payment. If they didn't, they'll get penalized. And everyone who delegated towards them will get penalized as well. So it can come back to this in questions if uh, anyone wants to dig in or address it after. Um, the last thing technical that I want to mention is the CDN piece. Um, some of you may have heard of a project called Swarm. It's kind of Ethereum's file storage network, and it's a CDN for static content. We've extended it to support live content and live streaming. Uh, we also have a backend that works on libp2p, which is the IPFS networking layer, um, so that we can work kind of across the, the Web3 stack. Um, and kind of peer-to-peer -peer content delivery is really interesting. It can save about... 85 to 90 percent of the bandwidth off of traditional origin CDNs when the peers who are consuming the streams are also the ones who are delivering them, kind of like in BitTorrent. Um, so we're really excited about that layer as well. Um, so finally, this is a little small um, project status and where we're at. We're about nine months into building LivePeer. We've had a proof of concept with video peer-to-peer uh, -peer working out for six, six months. Sorry I couldn't show it to you today. Eric, were you able my colleague Eric here thinks he might be able to get the demo working if you want to take over. <laughs> um, I'll keep talking while you get set up. Um, we launched a testnet last week with the implementation on the Ethereum blockchain. So any of you can actually run a node, uh, participate, be a transcoder, be a delegator, um, broadcast video through it. Um, we're really excited about that. It's still very technical, command line centric, um, but we're working towards one month, making it easier to use. Um, and we're working towards production. So, ah, nice, Eric got the node running. So he started our node, so like I said, we can broadcast into this using um, any broadcasting application. I'm gonna use a dApp that one of our community members built called LivePeer Desktop. And it's pretty simple, you hit the big red button. And so now we are broadcasting live into LivePeer. And I mentioned that that gives you an ID. You can either share a link or copy, copy the ID. And then anyone with this ID can play your video. So I'm going to access it through this other dApp, a web-based player that's pretty bare bones. And let's see if this, this works, our internet connection here. Boom. Peer-to-peer -peer decentralized live streaming. <laughs> it works. Uh, it's not vaporware. Um, and you see there's kind of about a 15 second latency, which is pretty conventional for, for live streaming, broadcasting. So, all right, I think um, that's kind of the gist of our presentation. The last thing I just wanted to say was that if you want to get involved, we'd love to have you. It's an open project, it's community driven. We have four core team members, but we have um, you know 10 to 20 contributors in the community all around the world. We'd love to have you join the testnet run a node. If you're building a dApp, maybe a social application, anything that could benefit from video, and you want to include video, talk to us. We can get that working inside your decentralized application. Um, we have lots of ideas for things we want to see built. Um, and the best way to place to find us is in our chat room on Gitter, gitter.im slash livepeer, or github.com slash livepeer. All the work's done in GitHub through the issues and everything. So we're livepeer. Thank you very much. Want to take some questions? Sure, yeah, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions if anyone has any. Who's got questions? No questions. You blew their mind. Oh, we got one. The, okay, the question was why swarm? Good question. So he's at, Jesse's asking about the content delivery layer. Um, Swarm is a project from the Ethereum Foundation. It's one of the three pillars of projects that they raise money for in their crowd sale. And it has very tight Ethereum integration. We're implemented on Ethereum. So the Swarm protocol is like if you want to store a file on this network, you pay Ether. Someone will give you a receipt to store it. And um, it'll be available. And if it's not available, they'll pay a big penalty back to you. 
And so because of this like tight Ethereum integration, we thought it was a great place to get started. It's already a CDN. It already passes content around um, between peers. And we just needed to extend it to support streaming and content that's not persisted forever. Um, so that was, and it was an open source project. So it was great to build on top of that as a head start. And then on the other side, there's this IPFS, um, the P2P ecosystem. And we're really excited about that because they actually have networking layer that supports WebRTC. It works in the web browser, it works on mobile. And even though it has less tight Ethereum integration and the incentives weren't designed yet, we were kind of waiting for the Filecoin paper to come out to provide their incentives. Um, we're excited about their networking layer and being able to work in the browser and, and mobile and everywhere that users want to be. So. Good question. So the question was, if a reporter wants to use live peer anonymously, can it be traced back to them? Um, this is live video, so that depends on how they conceal or reveal their identity when, if they're on camera. But the um, content itself is anonymous. You just have a, a cryptographic address, and um, you're passing the content peer to peer. So it you know, can't be traced to your identity in that way. There are certainly some weaknesses in how you broadcast. So for example, if you're going from your cell phone and your cell phone is communicating to one single cell tower and someone can identify the source of that video at the cell tower, um, that would be an opportunity to, you know, potentially censor or to try and identify uh, where the origin phone was. But that's much harder in an anonymous peer-to-peer decentralized system where the video is being passed amongst thousands of peers in cryptogra cryptographically secure packets. Um, much more, much harder than just everything going through Facebook, for example. So, cool. Time for one more question. One more question. Uh, the question was, which coin does the encoder operate on? Uh, earn, earn. They earn live peer token. So it's a token that's native to our protocol. It's used to broadcast, and it's used for the proof of stake and the verification of work uh, protocol. So it's a secure unit of account where all the stake in the system is measured off of this ledger. Um, it's, it's necessary that it be kind of accountable within this ecosystem in order to do the math to secure the system. Uh, no, no. The... Um, Mining is an analogy in the system. It's basically rewarded to the nodes that do the work and verify they did it, and everyone who participates in the delegation protocol of, of electing those nodes. So if you stake some token and elect um, transcoders, then you'll earn new token in proportion to your stake as long as they don't cheat. And if they cheat, you'll be penalized, so elect wisely. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. This is great. Great. Thanks, Doug. Um, fantastic. So I think there's this narrative that all this cryptocurrency stuff is this speculative bubble. It's amazing to see real projects, real applications being built on top of Ethereum uh, as a platform. So up next, we have uh, Alex and Alex from CoinFund. They are going to talk to us about uh, trends in decentralized social media. So, hey guys. Oh, don't work there. Hey everyone, welcome. We are uh, Coin Fund. This is uh, Alex Bolkin, and I'm Alex Felix. Um, we invest in blockchain projects uh, across the space, as well as spend a majority of our time uh, advising projects. Uh, on building products and uh, bringing their their project to market. Sorry if you couldn't hear me. Uh, so tonight we wanted to spend a little bit of time with you talking about decentralized social media. And what we want to focus on are some of the core properties of decentralized social media that can threaten incumbents. And these things are, are very simple, but potentially disruptive components that you can use blockchain uh, to unlock. Uh, and if you really think about why Facebook was so successful, 
it was the first platform to introduce social interactivity. So let me kind of jump forward here. So when we think about the problem, uh, the problem that the, the space faces is that we have a, a larger amount of control by fewer entities. And that sort of leads to opportunities for spam, uh, difficulties for any competitors to compete when you have sort of moats around those businesses. But those businesses are sort of focused on their own monetization models and less so on the customer centric experience. Uh, so he here's a slide and again, we're gonna focus a little less on the product and more on the, the sort of underlying innovations and, and growth hacks that these projects are using. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I am <laughs> blocking, blocking the own presentation here. Um, so number one is kind of the technology, um, social media platforms span from having their own blockchain protocol to using an ERC-20 token on top of Ethereum. Um, you know, next is sort of the innovation layer, which, you know, talks about the, the specific purpose that that uh, service, you know, seeks to disrupt. So if we take Steemit, for example, what they're using is, is a process of, of speculative economics. And speculative economics is that they are inflating their currency to reward users and content curators in return for people actually buying the currency in the market. So the price of the currency is whatever people are willing to buy it for, but they are using inflation of their supply to pay people to do things. So it's, it's kind of a highly reflexive system where when, when momentum and the price of the currency is going up in the speculative markets and new people want to buy in and join the ecosystem, people operating the ecosystem are actually earning more and more and vice versa on the, on the other side. So it's kind of a, it, it's an early stage test, but it, it's, they continue to kind of refine the model and balance the system. So that's extremely interesting. Uh, and the growth hack there is, is customer acquisition because you can actually pay people to do things and pay people to join the network with currency that you've, you've generated and then someone else is, is buying on the speculative markets. Um, Leroy is, is a very simple decentralized Twitter. Uh, it deals with, it has elements of stateless smart contracts where it can use an extremely low amount of gas by, uh, by keeping all the information in the, in the call function. Uh, and what this solves is, is micro tipping and improving signal to noise. So you have a, pr a product that you actually have to pay to tell someone you want to uh, say something to someone. And that's, you know, sort of improves quality. And people also see kind of micro returns on investment because often you, you pay one cent. And if you're focused on delivering value for others, similar to how you would if as a presenter, you know, your core focus is to teach everyone else something, then you will be rewarded for that and see a return on your, on your one cent. Um, Kick and Kin, who will present next, uh, is an extremely compelling project that's built on a programmable rewards engine that seeks to create massive network effects by allowing people an incentive to join and adopt Kin. Um, so they're gonna spend a little more time on that. But what that model allows is, is for a centralized company to launch a network that will extend far beyond their actual application. And that will create massive network effects and almost diminish any centralized risk of, of Kin having, you know, being an operator on that platform. And lastly, we have Civil, which is a, a crowdsourced, or sorry, it's a decentralized platform for journalism. And they're sort of flipping the model on their on its head a little bit, and I'll let Alex uh, Bolkin talk about this a little more. But they're actually going to pre-fund writers who then will go out and create content that these people would like to uh, read. So those are sort of the, some of the growth hacks there, and that you know we'll talk about a little bit more on the, on the next slide here. So this kind of goes through a couple of the, the main points. Um, number one being the speculative economics we discussed. And these, these five core features sort of present that opportunity to, to dethrone incumbents. Uh, so 
Number one, speculative economics, the customer acquisition and rewards model problem. Number two, user experience. Products are actually built with the user in mind and not the monetization scheme of the company. Uh, data control and access, this is a big problem today where a lot of companies take all our data, repackage it, and sell it. Uh, so this is a way to actually control you know, who owns you and, and what your information you're giving them. Uh, it's compensatory, which means that you're also being paid directly for the value that you're creating. It's not the YouTube model where they receive advertising dollars and they somehow then you know, redistribute some of that money. Uh, this is a very direct relationship to the value you're creating is what you're earning. And lastly, uh, the democratic ownership is, is a really underrated, or, or maybe it's not less underrated these days, but this is what's driving sort of this boom in cryptocurrencies, is that when you are a part owner in one of these networks, you feel compelled to promote it, to evangelize it, to use it. And, and this is now at a really granular scale where you have people in many different countries as part owners in the same network and helping to grow that network in any way they can. Uh, and being an early adopter you know, puts you in a, in a good position as that network continues to grow. So when you have the option to earn in network shares, you also have the option to you know, hold the, the interest in that network or go and sell it on the market for cash. So that, the, that fundamental property is a powerful one when you may only have to sell a little bit to cover your expenses and you can continue to sort of grow your interest in the network. So I'll leave, uh, I don't want to take too long. I'll, I want to let Alex uh, talk about his slides, but thank you. My, my mic didn't work. Um, I'm going to do something different, not what we thought we were going to do. Um, so I study crypto economics at CoinFund, um, and I kind of think about what it is that we can achieve with incentives that are, come from our ability to create tokens on, on blockchain. And, you know, if you look at this whole picture, uh, it's basically trying to, in, in small steps here and there, to re redefine the incentives that drive uh, people's participation in the media. So if you think about Facebook, right, there's content being published by friends to friends, and <clears throat> when you achieve a certain um, critical mass, you know, a bunch of people want to join because they want to be read, and they want to read what other people write. In this model here, you see a very different picture because that's not the only reason why people are joining the system. So, for example, you know, Leroy is a really cute <clears throat> young project that, uh, is basically trying to uh, do what people kind of think is impossible, which is like a micropayment tipping model. You know, it's like it's never succeeded, but if you actually go to Leroy and, and, and register and try to use it, it's actually extremely compelling. And so what Leroy is is a clone of Twitter with micro-tipping where you pay for transactions. And what you get from that also is the fact that it's going to be completely clean of spam because the incentives of, uh, of a spammer is to reach as many people as possible, as cheaply as possible. Well, guess what? And guess what? On Leroy, you have to pay a transaction fee to do anything whatsoever, so you can't possibly do any spam. Hence, the incentives are actually balanced a little more towards, you know, bona fide content. I don't know if it's going to be good or bad, but it's definitely not going to be spam. Um, civil is trying to do crowdsourced fact-checking, and Steemit also is trying to do crowdsourced uh, uh, content quality uh, from the inception. Uh, and <clears throat> I don't know if you think Steemit has succeeded at that or not, but it's an interesting idea that you use crypto-economic incentives to incentivize something that is um, basically completely um, uh, subjective, which is content quality. Only a human being can decide whether it's good or not, so it's a really complex problem, and in working with a civil team, I, I, I really enjoy thinking about this problem, and <clears throat> actually civilists might uh, hire um, uh, services of a behavioral economics research consulting company just to look at this problem and, and try to design crypto economics that, that actually achieve what it states. How much time do we have? Um, so 
what 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 is happening in this space right now is there is <clears throat> the, this huge barrier to entry, and whatever currently exists doesn't actually do quite what people want. So everybody is talking about how it is that we can you know compete with Facebook, compete with Twitter, and all of these systems are very young, but notably. You know, the, the, the potential for success here is huge because last summer, just based on um, a speculative crypto economics of Steemit, Steemit has acquired, you know, uh, more than, I think, 100,000 people. It's like the only uh, one of the very few crypto projects that actually has a non-trivial uh, number of non-crypto savvy people or, you know, mainstream users. Uh, that are actually actively using it. Um, and so we basically see this as having kind of great potential to, to disrupt the social media industry. And um, this is a little bit of a summary of, of what the... Sorry. Uh, right, this is a little bit of a summary of what the, the, the disruptive experiment is, is trying to achieve in, in this space. Um, questions? Yes. For retention? Uh, actually, that's a really cool question? question because... Repeat the question. The, uh, the question was, what are the statistics for user retention? And, and the only project for which the question currently makes sense is Steam. And the answer is that it's kind of like win some, lose some, because Steam, uh, joining Steam is highly incentivized by the speculative economics. So when Steam is high, the network actually pays a lot of money to people who write. And so a lot of people join it and generate a whole bunch of content. And then, you know, the market tanks, Steam goes down, and, and then the activity really noticeably goes down. So, uh, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. But one of the, the things that's so interesting about Steemit is it's a, it's a blockchain, right? So you can go out and there are implementations of analytics built to analyze the Steam blockchain. So you can actually create a dashboard around, you know, how many new users joined this week, how many total users are active, how many people posted, how much did people earn, and you can actually understand you know, the, the user metrics really granularly and really well. And that's one of the core features of, of this technology, we think, is the ability to analyze systems and the health of systems while they're operating and, and in real time. So the, the retention has been an issue as, as they haven't quite figured out the balance of, uh, you, you know, those speculative properties and how much they're, they should pay people and the growth rate that they're experiencing of new users. Uh, but it's they're constantly refining the model, and uh, it seems to be improving. Uh, more questions? Yes. In the crypto media space, who are the big players? Well, um, so. Oh, we don't have that as a slide, right? Um, well, I think right now Steam is probably the biggest existing uh, platform. Um, there is a few other ones that are kind of alpha and, and beta stage. There's Akasha and yours um, that that have been. I personally haven't seen Akasha. I don't know if the, has the alpha been released. Yeah, they've been promising a release of the alpha for a really long time. Oh, yeah, and, and also you might want to go to our blog. Jake uh, wrote an article on this, and he mentions uh, a bunch of platforms. Yes? Um, I think other than people trying to um, uh, process Steemit data, which is the, those Steemit dashboards, I don't think we've seen much third-party 
effort in, in, in processing. Like Steam has really existed for quite a long time right now. It's one of the oldest active projects in the space. So, so it's now at a stage where you can kind of like look at it. Everything else is very, very nascent. But one of the, the core interesting uh, properties of, what, of the question you ask is when you have an underlying blockchain like Steemit, you really can build any UX experience you want on top of it. And we actually see a world where you would have competitive or just different UX experiences on top of the same blockchain that might highlight or promote, you know, certain interests for certain people. Um, and, you know, those would be potentially be a centralized, you know, website that, you know, you could draw a bunch of users to by building a cool implementation of, of data that's, that's uh, implemented in that blockchain. So that, that, that in and of, a, of itself is a, you know, could be an interesting field going forward. How much time do we have? One more question. One more question. Of what? Huh? The question was, is Steemit the uh, income, the decentralized version of Akamai? I, I'm not as familiar with Akamai, but it's a similar to a, a decentralized medium. Um, it's it's so a medium. hybrid between decentralized medium and decentralized Reddit. That's the way we think about it. Oh, oh, you mean in terms of like the distribution of content? Um, Steemit is, is a, is a social media application. It's not about content distribution. It's basically content that lives on the blockchain. It's a very different space than, than life peer. Is that, am I understanding your question correctly? It's, it's user generated content with basically, um, you know, pages and photos and writing and, All the data, uh, uh, just the text, I believe. I actually don't know where they store the images, but but they have a decentralized architecture for that. I think it's related to where, how is it CDN and how is the content delivered and where does it sit? The client reads it off of the blockchain. Um, why don't why don't you come over and and we can figure it out? Um, offline. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Coin Thank fun. you, everybody. Thank you very much. So up next, we have a fireside chat. There's no fire. Maybe we can put a video of a fire up. Uh, fireside chat between uh, Ted Livingston and Jesse Walden. So Jesse is the it was a co-founder of Media Chain, which was an early decentralized media uh, company based here in New York City was recently acquired by Spotify. Uh, by the way, Jesse and I have been talking for several months now. Uh, thank you, Jesse, for getting this all organized. It's been a great event. Uh, at Ted Livingston, uh, CEO of Kick. Um, so you may be familiar with the Kick uh, app or the Kick messaging platform. Uh, he joins us from Waterloo, Ontario, uh, which, by the way, is actually a really Great hotbed for cryptocurrency. Uh, lots of great crypto talent comes out of Toronto. Vitalik went to Waterloo. Uh, I had an I had an intern from Water from Waterloo this summer. Very smart people at Waterloo. So, uh, take it away, guys. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, so I guess maybe we could we could just start off with a really basic question, which is you know we all know you're the CEO of Kick, but why, why did you start it? What it and what is it? Oh, so, sorry. The question, the question was, who are you? Why did you start Kick? And what is it? Okay, that's a good starting place. Um, so yeah, so my background is uh, I went to University of Waterloo 2005 and got to see mobile very early. So the cool thing about University of Waterloo, why I think so many good people come out of there, is if you in order to graduate, you must complete six four-month internships. So I did a bunch of internships at BlackBerry, uh, starting before the iPhone came out, saw mobile early, and sort of you know, realized mobile was going to be big. And my boss actually 
pulled me aside one day after two years of working there and said, hey, you're really good at this stuff. You should leave and start your own company. Um, best advice I ever got, BlackBerry was here at the time, and then two years later was here. <laughs> um, and so that's what I did. Uh, in 2009, January 2009, I founded Kick. Uh, so it's been about seven and a half years now. And with really this idea that mobile is going to become the center of our lives and that chat would really be at the center of mobile, that it would one day be the way we communicated not just with family and friends, uh, but also businesses as well. And so we built Kick. We launched it October 2010. We went zero to a million users in 15 days back in 2010, the fastest growing thing in like known human history. Uh, and then fast forward today, obviously chat is a very crowded space. There's a bunch of different big messengers. But what really makes Kick unique is it's quite different than the other messengers. Like if you were to get it, you go get it, you're like, wow, it looks like all the other messengers. But the fundamental difference is on Kick, your user, your identity is based on a username. So it's not a phone number, it's not a social profile, it's just a username. So the reason people really like it is you can come in, you can be who you want to be, and then you get to sort of hang out and make friends in this environment without judgment. So you know, more and more teams are hanging out online, they want a place to just hang out, be who they want to be. They don't want it to be about getting more friends, getting more likes, getting more story views. They just want to hang out and make friends, and they do that on Kick. Cool. And so one thing I've heard a bit about is that Kick has had some experience with digital currency on the platform in its past. Nothing to do with cryptocurrency, but there, there's been sort of transactions as part of the experience as with messaging as sort of the base platform. So I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about experiences to date with currency on the platform, what you guys have learned from that, and what it means, you know, why people in this room might be interested in it. Yeah. There's a lot of questions in your questions. Um, <laughs> so I'll go through them. But remind me if I forget any. So I think if, like, if we just go back another step, um, you know, why do we get into cryptocurrency sort of goes back to how did we view chat? back in the beginning. And I think the thing we thought about chat is on one side, we got really excited. It could become this central hub of daily life, how you connect with friends, families, businesses, and that that would be really important to society. But if it was going to become this really important thing, really important to society and daily life, it should be open and decentralized. That's sort of how we started the company. But the problem with that is in order to build the company, we needed to, one, take a lot of money from investors, and two, take a lot of time from our team. And they wanted to get a financial return from that. So on one side, we want to make this open, amazing thing. And then on the other side, people want a financial return. And this is where we really got excited about Bitcoin back in 2011, where it was like Bitcoin for the first time ever could provide a solution to this problem where now, for the first time ever with blockchain, you could actually guarantee the scarcity of a digital asset. So once you create a cryptocurrency on the blockchain, you can guarantee for the first time ever that there will never be more. So, you know, there's going to be 21 million Bitcoins. For the first time ever, we can say there will never be more. You know, whereas before with air, airline miles or any other sort of digital asset, somebody could always print more. And so what that meant is guaranteed scarcity, if you could create a new cryptocurrency, there's only ever going to be so much of it, guaranteed scarcity, guaranteed supply. If you could grow the demand for it, then the price, the value of that cryptocurrency would go up, such that if you set some aside for yourself at the beginning, you could make a lot of money. And so this was the exciting insight for us, is like for the first time ever, it's like you could have open and valuable and so this is something we started working on, went to like Bitcoin conferences. I had a Bitcoin conference in January 2012. It was like 13 people. Gavin, the lead developer on Bitcoin, was there. And Ted, this kid from Waterloo, was there being like, I love Bitcoin, but it's flawed. Nobody's going to use it. Nobody's earning in Bitcoin. That's what we need to figure out. And then we could have a mainstream cryptocurrency. Fast forward to 2014, we launched Kick Points, which was a new digital currency inside of Kick, where we wanted to test this experiment of, what if we created a digital currency where you couldn't buy it and you couldn't sell it? You could only earn it and spend it inside of Kick. So it started with you could earn it by watching ads and you could spend it by buying smileys. But then over time, we built up more and more ways to earn and more and more ways to spend. 
And we got to this point where millions of consumers were earning and spending in this digital currency to the point where it was like three times the global transaction volume of Bitcoin. And we did this with a team of like a, a handful of people. And so that's where we really said, hey, there's something here. Um, this, this could actually work. It was a bit of a crazy idea. Like, hey, instead of doing ads, let's build an economy around a new cryptocurrency. Uh, so then fast forward to today, 2017, um, we're all in on this. You know, we try to do the ads things. We don't have the data scale of these monopolies to effectively monetize through advertising. You know, selling stuff in a world where those monopolies give everything away for free is impossible. So not only is a cryptocurrency as a third option a, a great option, but for us, it's actually, we believe, the only option. Cool. I, I think you touched on a really interesting point there, with, which is, you know, Kick is a pretty scaled up startup, as startups go, but you're, you've, you've been sort of radically transparent that you're facing growth challenges, you know, against like the internet giants, Google, Facebook, um, Apple, who obviously have a huge stake in the messaging market. Um, and so the, that, it's, it's, it's one interesting that you're transparent about that, and I think that's led to, you know, a lot of conversations, you know, critics who are looking at you guys doing a, a cryptocurrency launch, and they're starting to ask the question, hey, is this a mature startup that's just facing user growth problems? Is this a bailout? Um, for the for a startup that's looking for a return on its investment, and you yourself said in in a recent interview, like you know that cryptocurrencies do present a fundamentally uh, new way for startups to exit. So I'm wondering, can you can you speak a little bit to critics who who make that criticism, and and I guess as part of that, explain you know what what is the real vision here? What are you expecting to get from from Kin, and does it allow you to compete with internet giants? A lot of questions. A yeah. lot of questions. <laughs> but I have to give long answers. <laughs> Jesse and I, we were both in the Union Square Ventures portfolio together, so we go back. Um, I think that criticism is totally fair. Um, about a year and a half ago, a journalist asked us, how is growth going? And we actually said, we're struggling. And the journalist like looked at me like, I can't believe you just said that. He like wrote it down. He's like, this is going to be the best article ever. This, you know, billion dollar company is struggling with growth. I can't believe you said that. And we're just like, oh, I, I thought that's, you know, somebody asked you a question. You just give them the honest response. I, I didn't know that was a big thing. And, you know, it was a bit painful for a while because the impression it gave the industry was that Kick was uniquely struggling. And that, that was our impression is that we were uniquely struggling. But what we have found out since then is pretty much every consumer service was struggling. You know, SoundCloud, I know we're here at Spotify, but laying off a huge chunk of their staff. Twitter is not growing anymore. Even Snapchat, I think that was the final piece for us. We looked at Snapchat at their S1 at the end of last year, and we're like, wait a second. These guys have raised billions of dollars. They have thousands of employees. They had amazing product insight, and amazing execution, and even they are struggling. And so this is when we decided, like, if even Snapchat is struggling, we are on a losing path. Everybody is on a losing path. And that's where we decided as, an, as a board with our investors and as a team that we had to go all in on cryptocurrencies. Because I think the, the key thing here is it's always been hard for us to find a sustainable business model, right? We don't have the scale to do ads. We can't sell anything because everybody expects everything for free. So, you know, we, all we can do is just raise more money at hopefully higher and higher prices. But that means, you know, we're trying to build a team with tens of millions of dollars. Well, Facebook, for example, is making $10 billion a quarter. So, like, how do we compete with that? And we really needed to define a sustainable business model. So that's when we said a cryptocurrency could fundamentally change that for us. Now it's not about build a community to show them ads. It's not about build a community to try to sell them stuff. It's build a community and get them providing value to each other, facilitating that with a cryptocurrency. Like really build a new economy, a virtual economy around a cryptocurrency. And that's what we tested out with Kick Points. And if we could do that, we could make a lot of money and we could compete again at the next level. But the thing that was really interesting was we said, wait a second, if we just took Kick Points, and we put that on the blockchain, it would be the most used cryptocurrency in the world. That would be cool. That would probably make 
kick points, pretty valuable. But then we had this bigger idea. What if we took a big chunk of that cryptocurrency, and instead of keeping it for ourselves, we set it aside for developers as an incentive to grow the number of places that you could earn and spend kin beyond kick. Okay, and this is what's called, we call the kin rewards engine. We said, okay, yeah, we're gonna create this economy inside kick, more and more people will earn and spend it in more and more ways, and that will sort of grow the value of the currency like this. But what if we could go to other digital services and say, hey, if you create ways to earn and spend kin inside your digital service, you'll be growing the value of the currency because now there'll be more transaction volume, more people. What if that amount that you grew the value of the economy, the size of the economy by integrating kin, what if we found a way to get that value back to you through rewards engine? So now instead of everybody building their own cryptocurrency, all of these digital services would be economically aligned to all build this ecosystem together. And that's where we said, okay, it shouldn't be kick points. It should be something more broad, bigger. And that's where we came up with the name Kin and Family. It's, yes, we'll use Kick to launch Kin. That will give it its value. But then we'll use the cryptocurrency as a tool to economically incentivize the creation of hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of other places where consumers can go to earn and spend Kin. What do you think about that? It's, I mean, it sounds to me like you're, it's a big bet on open source, which is fascinating. And so one, I guess a, a follow-up there is like, you're, you're sort of saying, you know, Kick, Kick as a company you mentioned earlier is 125 people. Um, you guys have been building the app for, since 2009, building out new features. And now you're saying there's this whole world of developers out there who have talent. So it's, it's sort of a bet that there's more talent outside the company than the sum of talent inside the company. And the, it sounds like the Kin Rewards engine is a way to bring those people in to, totally. towards a common goal. Totally. That's exactly right. Like we as, I think we have like 150 people, as a 150 person company doing a million different things are never going to be able to compete with these monopolies. But what we are feeling, the pain we are feeling as like a top 100 app is the pain that thousands, tens of thousands of developers are feeling. Everybody's saying, I want to build great stuff, but I just can't find a model. I can't get paid. I can't make this my living. So i got to go work for these big monopolies. And so what we're saying to them is not only can this be a business model for Kick, a way for us to make money by growing the value of this asset, but it can also be a business model for you. So you can pursue your passion. You can build amazing stuff that you want to build to provide value to consumers. Don't do ads. Don't do any of that crap. Just Grow, bring people together, find a way for them to provide value to each other, whether it's in music or games or live streaming or chat. And the more you do that, the more money you will make. And so I, that's the other thing I love. It's like amazing. It aligns all these developers, but it also aligns with consumers. So now it's like a developer's goal. Like, listen, consumer, you're in my service. I don't want to show you ads. I don't want to sell you stuff. I just want you to get compensated for the value you provide to this ecosystem. So take, basically, you're taking, you know, kick the company, and you're you're sort of dissolving it into this larger community of just developers. Where kick is a developer, you're, you're open sourcing the app at some point, right? And then now you're you're just one developer among this, you know, the entire sea of developers out there that want to develop a chat-based application. Not just chat-based, like any application. Um, so I think that's that's exactly right. Like the way I think of it is, number one, imagine somebody some new project created Kin. Hey, we're going to create this new ecosystem of digital services for consumers. So you can go to all these different places, all these great services. But everybody would be like, well, who's going to adopt that? So now we're saying, well, actually, we signed up the first digital service. And it's this company called Kick, this app called Kick. It has 15 million monthly active users. It's a top 100 app in the US. And it's actually the number five most searched for term in the app store because everybody uses it to connect across communities. Everybody would be like, wow, Kin, that sounds amazing, and you've already signed up Kick, this top 100 app? Like, that's a really exciting project. And so that, what we think is like the killer innovation is, not only have we built the platform and the ecosystem with Kin, but we've also found that first killer app. And, you know, if you look at the history of platforms, that's always how they evolve. You know, like, 
Nintendo had Super Mario Brothers. Windows had Excel. Um, even the iPhone had the iPod. So we think we have both a platform and a killer app to start this whole thing. Awesome. And yeah, there's a, while we're, you know, this is really early days for crypto. And especially when it comes to like, you know, consumer media applications, I think there's a sharp contrast between the users of those applications and the people who are like really deep into crypto that, you know, it's still pretty nerdy at this stage. And a lot of the, I think a lot of the challenges are around how do you get people to understand what cryptocurrency is, how to manage private keys to move cryptocurrency around, what, where you can, you know, spend the cryptocurrency, where you exchange it, what the volatility means. So these are like big, cha hard challenges that sort of stand in the way of adoption. That's what keeps me up at night when I think about large scale adoption of cryptocurrencies. I'm curious, you know, what are, what are you thinking about? What, uh, what do you hope to learn when this thing launches? So I think I put the challenges into two buckets. I think the first bucket is around getting consumers to understand it and volatility and all these things. And I think that's what we really wanted to show with kick points is if that you could create an economy, a virtual economy where people were earning in the digital currency and then immediately spending in the digital currency. And there was like no outside exchange. Like you couldn't buy, you couldn't sell. You could only earn it and spend it that it would greatly reduce the effects of volatility. Because now you're saying, listen, I, I do this over here, I host a great group chat, I earn one kin, and then I go over here and I you know, get a great sticker and I spend one kin. I don't care if one kin is a dollar, I don't care if it's $10, or not nearly as much, because everything I want to do is in kin. And I think that's sort of like here, right? Like, you get your paycheck in US dollars, you go buy pizza with US dollars, do you care what the exchange rate is with Australian dollars? Like. No, I don't really care. Some people will care, but not very many people. So I think that's the first thing. That's what we proved with kick points is, and that was our fundamental problem with Bitcoin, is nobody's earning in Bitcoin. And so therefore, people are just speculating on it. We wanted to find a way to get people earning so they'd actually use it. The second category of problems is with the blockchain and the technology. There's a bunch of challenges here. You know, scalability is a real issue. You know, if, if we wanted to go in and just give one kin to each of our users, we'd tie up the Ethereum network for something like 30 days. Take 30 days, like you get one kin, you get one kin, we come back 30 days later, and you get one kin. <laughs> and that, it would take them the whole network. And so I think, you know, getting that scalability, that's a big challenge. What, how we're going to do it is we want everything to be on-chain from day one, and so we're going to do sort of like a Gmail-style rollout inside of Kik. So we're going to start with just a thousand users, and then from there, as we figure out the scalability, we we increase the scalability of the blockchain, whether it's on Ethereum, whether it's on our own sort of blockchain 3.0 project, or somebody else's blockchain 3.0, I call it. Um, as we can increase the scalability, we'll increase the size of the consumer base using it. And then the other big thing is, you know, private keys. You know, we think it's really important that it's all on chain and the user controls their private keys for a bunch of reasons. But for a consumer, it's like, so if I lose this key, it's gone? And they're like, no, 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 I, I call you guys and you give me the key back. And we're like, no, 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 it's gone, right? And consumer's like, oh, I can never use that. <laughs> and so I think that's like the big, the second big category of technology problems, really product problems is innovating around how people use keys, how recovery works, how fraud works, all these different things. But I think that's where Kick has a great track record. Like we were the first chat up to go viral in 2010, the first chat up to become a platform in 2011, and the first chat up in the Western world to launch bots in 2014. So we have like a history of innovation around product in these new emerging areas. Yeah, I think that the product experience on those challenges will be an amazing learning experience for the entire space because those those challenges are really I think something that any developers here are thinking about building a decentralized media application are thinking about how are we going to get people to actually use this thing and interact with it and the this sort of UX is just so trailing behind the excitement in the space totally and, and so how do you think about like the challenges in the space you know we're here at Spotify Spotify bought media chain which was really cool like wow good for you Spotify and good for you media chain how are you guys thinking about it now that you've been here this you know, another big company. Yeah, so we're we're tracking the space closely. Frankly, the kick announcement was a really big deal for us here inside of Spotify because it's like, hey, big companies are starting to think about this stuff. Obviously, we've been thinking about it for a long time prior. And so 
at, at the moment, we're just sort of exploring, you know, from a research standpoint, how might this play a role? You know, Spotify, one way to think about it, you have on one side uh, artists, and then on the other side, obviously, they're fans. And we're constantly looking for ways to bring them closer and closer together. Um, the uh, idea that, you know, potentially there's a token that maybe an artist creates or a token that allows for exchange, like you're talking about, that, that's a fascinating way to remove some of the middlemen that are currently um, in between that exchange. And, you know, Spotify as a platform is constantly looking to do that and bring artists and fans together more directly. So there's a lot of alignment in, I think, the spirit of the blockchain space and cryptocurrency space and, and what Spotify is trying to do for artists. So Awesome. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, I wanted to maybe shift gears a little bit and talk technical a little bit more um, specifically like, you know, why, so why Ethereum? You know, I, I think, I think there's a lot of parallels. Um, if you think about like a loyalty program, like Starbucks runs or something like that, you know, so, there are a lot of similarities in that, you know, Starbucks is trying to, you know, incentivize people to do certain things that benefit Starbucks. And with Kin, you're trying to incentivize developers to, you know, build applications or that, that will drive, you know, both systems are trying to incentivize people to do stuff that the, the system architect wants to do. So why Ethereum versus, you know, any other blockchain solution or a non-blockchain solution? Okay, two questions in there. Why Ethereum? Mm -hmm. Is it like rewards? Okay. So why Ethereum, I think, is really simple. It's a really easy way to get into the market. Um, it's the best blockchain to build for right now. We can create a new cryptocurrency new token very quickly and easily. And then we set it up such that as new blockchains emerge, if they have higher scalability, we can move between blockchains. We can move the cryptocurrency. So I think that's the first one. Um, in terms of like rewards program, I think that's right. Like with a rewards program, you're trying to create an incentive system to incentivize the behavior that you want to see. So I think in that way, like, Starbucks points and Kin or any other cryptocurrency are similar. But where I think it's different and really compelling is in the Starbucks model, if I go, if you go to Starbucks and you drink a ton of coffee and you get a bunch of Starbucks points, that doesn't help me. And if I go to Starbucks and I drink a bunch of coffee and I get a bunch of Starbucks points, that doesn't help you. But in a cryptocurrency, the opposite is true. If I come in and I provide a, a bunch of value and I create demand for this cryptocurrency, then the value of the cryptocurrency overall is going to go up. So, and it goes up for me and it goes up for you. And if you're a developer creating a bunch of demand for uh, Kin and a bunch of ways to earn and spend, you're getting this reward engine, daily payout, you're causing the value of the cryptocurrency to go up as well. And it's going up for you and it's going up for me. So it'd sort of be like if at Starbucks... You know, if you, listen, I don't have to do anything. I went and drank coffee one day and I got one Starbucks point. But tomorrow you go in and you drink a coffee every day for the next year. That now is economically benefiting me. So it's sort of like a networked incentive system. And I think that's like the super powerful thing about cryptocurrencies is it can economically align a large group of people to all work together to create amazing new things. Awesome. How are we doing on time? Do we want to open it up to questions soon? So, yeah, I mean, this conversation is amazing. It's 8 o'clock. I think there's probably lots of questions. Maybe we'll let the audience. Sure. Let's do it. So the question is, it seems like a closed system. Have you ever considered it opening it up so that you could use it outside? So Kin is an ERC-20 token. So you get it, it's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. But I think you know, the problem with cryptocurrencies is like they're, they're great to speculate on. You know, I'll get one, I'll hold it, and hopefully it will go up. But nobody actually uses them for transactions, real transactions. And so what I think the innovation of our project is, one is we have a, we have a, 
you know, a test where we got millions of people earning and spending in a new digital currency. That's one. But two, we've created this really interesting rewards engine to incentivize other developers to create places beyond Kick where you can earn and spend Kin as well. Cool. Any other questions out there? of Ken. Did you guys hear me? Yeah, I heard you. How do you separate the private entity of Kick with the foundation? So that's your question, right? So um, we are, so maybe I'll just talk about the allocation for a second. So we're creating Tuesday next week. It's been a long time coming. I'm very excited. 10 trillion Kin tokens. Okay? I was like, wow, that's a lot. It's actually not a lot. You know, it's just a matter of where the decimal place falls. Um, the reason why 10 trillion versus 21 million bitcoins, for example, is because if I host a great group chat or make a great playlist or build a great game, I don't want to earn 0. 0.00001 bitcoin. I'd rather earn 10 kin. Okay, so, you know, this is our lens on everything. Everything's about the consumer making it really easy to understand. So we're creating 10 trillion kin. And we're selling one trillion Tuesday next week in a token distribution event. I'll talk about that in a second. We're putting aside three trillion for a kick, vesting in at ten percent a quarter for ten quarters, so over two and a half years. That's Kick's incentive for being the first killer app on this platform. How we convinced our investors to do this. And then we're setting six trillion can aside for the foundation and the rewards engine. And those will vest into the market at 20% of whatever is left of that six trillion each year paid out daily. Okay, so it's sort of like the mining reward. You know, there's some that keeps getting paid out, but less and less and less, hopefully at higher and higher prices. So in terms of separating like the, the private entity of Kick and the, the, the foundation, the Kin Rewards engine, today, you know, obviously Kick has influence on both. And that's what we need to do to get it going. But over time, the idea is Kick becomes just another participant in this much broader ecosystem. And this Kin Foundation becomes this independent, open, and ultimately completely decentralized organization that's goal is to get Kin used in as many places as possible. So like grow the overall size of the economy, whether that's in Kick or hopefully well beyond Kick. Why, over time, will we want the Kin Foundation as Kick to be as independent as possible? Is simply because it's in our best economic interest. This is the thing I love about cryptocurrencies is so many times, like, why would we open source Kick for the users? Because we'll make more money. Because the more we grow the, the usage of this asset, the, the ecosystem around it, the more valuable the currency, the more valuable our 30%. If people perceive that, hey, this Kin Foundation, they're favoring Kik as one of these participants in the system, nobody will adopt it, and Kin won't be worth anything. And so it's just in our economic best interest, which is always the best test. If it's in somebody's economic best interest, they're probably going to do it. And so that's how we tried to set it up here. Maybe I'll just also talk about the token distribution event. We're taking a totally new approach on this, and so for those of you that have projects, um, we, think they're, we think it's going to be cool. Um, so there's two ways typically to do a token distribution event. On one side, you can say, hey, we're only going to raise this much money, and whoever gets in first gets it all. So this is what happened with the bad ICO, $35 million, 200 people ended up taking all of that $35 million. A bunch of people who wanted BAT got left out, and then those 200 people immediately flipped it onto exchanges for an immediate two to three times return. So everybody's pissed off. Like, why did you give it to these guys that don't care about the project at all, and they made all the money, and you didn't give it to us? So then what people did is they said, oh, 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 we have a solution. What if we just take as much money as people want to give us for a period of time, and then we'll divide it up from there? So, oh, great, now everybody can participate, but we get these 150, 200, 250 million dollars as like a team of five people. They're like, damn, that was sweet. Like... <laughs> And it's like, we're like, okay, that, we don't want to do that either. That just feels irresponsible. And so what we said is like, could we get the bo best of both? 
So we are raising 125 million, you know, and, and our last round we raised 50 million. So it's about double every time we raise money, we raise about twice as much money. 125 million capped round. But then on the other side, to make sure that everybody can participate who wants to, we are requiring people to register ahead of time with their passports. Okay? This is part I love. I love this. So how do we make sure it's fair that people aren't double dipping, getting extra allocation, taking it all, is we go and we say, if you want to participate Tuesday next week, you must register at kin.kick.com by this Saturday at 9 a.m. Eastern with your passport and Ethereum address. If you do not register, you will not participate, period. Since then, since we announced that, we've had 15,000 people from 134 different countries register with their passports. Okay? It is awesome. And, and we, we didn't expect like that many like people like, here's my passport. And then we're like, we get all these passports. And we're like, we, we're working with a bunch of different vendors to verify them and do all this stuff. But it actually, there's a manual review and there's like training for it. It's all hands on deck. And I'm actually, like, we're like, oh man, we need way more people doing this. So actually, I jumped in. And I reviewed passports. I reviewed 200 passports. It took me two hours. I got the training, did the passports. So cool. It's like, here's their passport. Here's their selfie. Here's all their information. And I'm like, okay. I'm like the customs guy. I'm like, welcome to Kinland. <laughs> <laughs> you're in. You're out. Um, and the cool thing is I did about 200 passports. And in those 200 passports, there were 50 unique countries. Countries I had never even heard of. And so what, so this is cool. So we've got 15,000 passports so far. There's still a day and a half to go or whatever it is. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that 75 million and equally divide it between all those people who registered. And so on Tuesday, it's not this like race at the door. It's, hey, you signed up. 75 million divided by 15,000 is whatever that number is, $6,000. We have a conversion rate or exchange rate between Ether and, and dollar. So send us up to this much Ether within 24 hours, and we will send you back the corresponding amount of kin. So everybody will have this opportunity. There's no rush. There's no like taking down the blockchain. Just very calm. You registered. You're equal. You get up to $6,000. If you want it all, send us this much Ether. If you want less, send us less. We'll send it back to you. So this guarantees that everybody who wants to participate can participate on day one on a capped round. We are then, by doing it that way, we're guaranteeing that we won't raise the $75 million in that first round because somebody registered, but they decide not to participate. Okay, there's $6,000 gone. Somebody registered, but they only participated at half the cap. Okay, there's $3,000 gone. So it will be actually quite a bit less. And then from there, we'll do subsequent rounds where we keep raising the cap. And in this way, we think we can do a global distribution with thousands and thousands of people in 134 and maybe more countries um, where everybody goes, that was awesome, that was fair, and I'm excited. And so we're excited about that. Awesome. And it, just to be clear, is it going to the Kin Foundation? So, so that is going to Kick, and we are using that to set up Kick and Kin as, you know, Kin set up the platform and then kick as the first killer app into that platform, and then get the reward engine and go from there. Hey, um, I was wondering if you could give like the 60 second version of how the reward engine works and how those you know, 1.2 trillion tokens will be distributed over the next year or so. Yeah, 1.2 trillion, it's gonna be awesome. Okay, so what we wanna do is, everybody heard the question, right? Yeah, you had a mic. What we want to do is, there's a bunch of developers out there, right? Everybody's looking at a, a cryptocurrency. And so the question everybody's going to ask themselves is, why would I adopt Kin when I could launch my own cryptocurrency and do my own token distribution of it? And so the answer we want to give to that is, because you will make more money. And so that's really how we thought about Kin, is how can we set it up such that as a developer who has a digital service, I go, I could do my own crypto currency, but if I adopt Kin, I'll just make more money. Because we think that's the way to unite all these developers to work together in s instead of spreading out all their efforts across hundreds, if not thousands, of these very small cryptocurrencies. So how do we do that? 
Well, first of all, we say, okay, you're a developer, you adopt a kin, you created places for people to earn and spend kin. How much is that increasing the value of the economy? And the answer to that is in transaction volume. So what we will do is we say every day, so there's that 1.2 trillion kin a year, that converts into a daily payout, and every day, we will look at the overall kin economy, and we'll go digital service by digital service, and we will add up transaction volume. So, hey, you did 1% of all the transaction volumes in the overall economy, you did 2%, you did 3%, and we will pay out that daily reward for that last 24 hours proportional to that. So, hey, maybe one day we'll get Spotify on there. Spotify did 10% of the transactions yesterday, they should get 10% of the daily reward. Now, the thing we haven't released yet, um, and we will, but not yet, is the obvious question is, but isn't that really gameable? Like, what if, you know, Jesse at Spotify is a little bit evil, and he says, instead of, like, creating real transactions, what if I just create a bunch of bots to send kin back and forth with each other, and I'll drive up this transaction volume, and, you know, who's real, who's a bot, you can't know. I think the secret sauce to the algorithm is how we solve for that problem, how we solve for gameability. Um, we're not releasing that yet. We're very excited about that. But that's really how the kin, that wasn't 60 seconds, but that's how the kin and rewards engine works is if the kin economy like is worth this much without you and this much with you, we're going to find a way, a fair, programmable, and ultimately decentralized way to get that value to you such that it's in your best economic interest to adopt kin versus build your own cryptocurrency. So you mentioned Kick and Snap and Twitter and all these other companies are suffering from lack of user growth. So you mentioned Kick, Snap, Twitter, all these other companies are suffering from lack of user growth. Kin won't necessarily solve that, even if the volume of, or the value of kin goes up over time. Kick still has to deal with users are not coming into the platform necessarily. I'm not saying that is or is not the case. So that still doesn't really solve the problem of longevity for a developer or platform adopting Ken. I guess, what are your thoughts on that or how are you guys planning for that? So two things, I, I think that's a great question. The first thing is with Kick, why couldn't we compete with these bigger companies is because we didn't have the resources. You know, we've raised $120 million, which seems like a lot of money, but that's been over the last eight years. So it's, you know, $15 million a year. And you're competing with guys that are making $10 billion a quarter, $40 billion a year. How many orders of magnitude is that? Three, over three. And so I think a big part of Can is giving us the resources to properly invest in the right things in Kick to actually be able to compete at a, at a higher level. Okay, so I think that's how Kick, this does actually really solve growth. But on the developer side, I think how the economy outside of Kick grows much faster is there's like all these different segments of consumers out there that have their own unique interests, things they want. And we're actually all pretty different, right? Like we don't, we, like I would could be very interested in this little thing and you're very interested in that little thing. But the way the economics of the industry are set up today is that the only people that can survive, that can make money become sustainable, you have to have massive scale. Because that's the only way you're gonna make any money with through ads, and if you can't make money through ads, you're gonna to go to business. So what does that mean? We have a world today where each of us probably only use a few very big apps that try to serve everybody in the same way. We believe that with this ecosystem and this new monetization model, we will be able to support many more developers building for many more niche interests. Because now it's not based on scale to get ads, it's about creating transaction volume to get a piece of this daily reward. And we think that will allow developers to build much better experiences for a specific group of consumers than these handful of monopolies try to build for everybody. You were talking about the 50 unique passports that you received, right? Did it, people from 
are, are any of those countries uh, giving any tax incentives for participating or doing transactions in kin or kick? And or are there any that are showing signs of giving developers tax incentives to uh, participate in that economy? I don't know. Um, but to me, that's like step eight. Okay. It's like tax incentives for like crypto. Really, we're, we're going to create a whole new financial system here, and there'll be lots of things we've got to figure out, but that's like way down the road. I think the, the bigger thing right now that regulators are trying to deal with is what the fuck do we do, okay? <laughs> because on one side, it's open and decentralized. So it's like the Internet. It's like, well, the we, only way to stop it is to turn off the Internet. We don't want to turn off the Internet. So, okay, it's unstoppable, okay? That's a problem. And then and they've got to decide on the what. On one side, there's like all this innovation, all this funding, all this stuff is coming out. I actually read a stat that uh, $700 million was raised last quarter through token distribution events which is more than all early stage investing. So already token distribution events have replaced venture capitalists, okay? The, you know, the venture capitalists might not know yet, but everybody else does, okay? So as a regulator, you're saying, okay, shit. Unstoppable, global. On one side, we need to protect the consumer because there are blatant scams, okay? There are blatant scams getting tens of millions of dollars in Ether. We can't have that. We all agree, right? We can't have that. But on the other side, if we do regulation wrong, we won't stop it. It will just move somewhere else. And, you know, I think this is what a lot of the analysis was with China saying token distribution events are illegal. Everybody in Silicon Valley is going, woo! Because all this innovation that was about to happen in China now can't happen there, and now Silicon Valley gets a huge head start. And so I think this is... The really interesting thing going forward, this is issue number one, is how do we do regulation such that we foster innovation, but we protect the consumer? I can add to that, um, that just today, there's, a, there's an organization in, in D.C. called Coin Center, and they do advocacy work for this technology to make sure that you know, regulators are informed and able to make smart decisions. And today, a bill was put forward that would um, essentially allow for small transactions, I think transactions under $600, to be tax-exempt. Because I think at, at the moment, at least in the U.S., if, you send, if I send you, like, you know, a tiny fraction of a Bitcoin to pay for a coffee or something, that's like a taxable, you know, capital gains event where – Based on what I paid for that Bitcoin, I have to measure if I gained or lost when I spent it. And that, that of course, like doesn't work very well when you're trying to do, you know, sell stickers or something like that. So, uh, yeah, so Coin Center has been doing work to try to make, you know, regulation favorable to small transactions, but still allow for this like investment use case as well. Yeah, I, that's awesome. Um, I think like the right analogy for this, too, is just like this is the dot com. Right. When the Internet came out, it, it was this new innovation, very disruptive at the time. Um, and on one side, it created all these opportunities, but on the other side, it created all these challenges. And, you know, regulars had a choice, like, oh, look at all the sex on the Internet. Like, shut it down. But if they did that, they would miss out on this decade's biggest opportunity of innovation and economic wealth generation. And so just like with the dot-com, I think, you know, crypto today is very similar. There's a lot of excitement. There's going to be a lot of money made. There's going to be a lot of money lost. But at the end of the day, something the size of Amazon and Google will come out of it. So the question is, what has developer interest been, and uh, what do we expect some of the use cases to be? So developer interest, if I just back up for a second, I think what's really interesting about Kick is we have a very long history of building platforms. So we became the first chat app in the world to become a platform so you could integrate other native apps back in 2011. First chat up to add a web platform in 2012. First chat up in the Western world to add bots in 2014. And with our bot platform today, we've had over 100,000 bots built for Kick. So we have a history of building for platforms. 
And we have a lot of excitement with our developer base around this. But because of these scalability issues, it will take some time. Okay. In terms of use cases, and this is not just for Kick, but you know, if we go broad for a second, you're trying to figure out how people can create value. All of these projects in crypto are about creating value and compensating those people who create the value. So, you know, it could be, hey, I'm really good at creating stock trading algorithms. It could be, hey, I'll give you some of my storage. It could be, hey, I'll give you some of my computational power. In Kick, it, it's ways that people, consumers, can provide value to other consumers. And so we think things like, I could host a great, great group chat for you, and you pay to join, and then you host a great group chat for me. Almost like a virtual Uber. Today, I'll drive for you, and I'll pay you 10 bucks, and, and you pay me 10 bucks, and tomorrow you drive for me, and I'll pay you 10 bucks. No money has changed hands, but we've both done a transaction. We've grown the economy. And so we're trying to create all the virtual equivalents of that. You know, I create a playlist for you, you create a playlist for me. I host a group chat for you, you host a group chat for me. I create content for you, you create content for me. And so those are all the sorts of use cases in the consumer space that we're looking at. Uh, what are some ideas or examples of how like free platforms would use Kin? Like maybe like if Twitter or Reddit or some some something you don't pay for, right? Like you you said on uh, Kick, you watch ads, right? Like, uh, are there other kinds of examples that would get already established platforms to think about how can we create these transactions? Yeah, so this is like the really interesting thing about crypto is you look at something like Twitter and you drop a cryptocurrency into it and it wouldn't work because Twitter is set up for maximum scale and maximum advertising. How Twitter would have to change their thinking to make crypto work is they'd have to step back and ask themselves, how are our users providing value to other users on the platform? And how could we create a marketplace around that facilitated with a cryptocurrency? So, you know, if I have to pay to read your tweets, like nobody's going to do that or kill the platform. But what are things that people would pay for? You know, you're talking about fans earlier. If I'm like a great tweeter, could I create a fan club? I haven't thought about Twitter, but you know we're talking about it now. Can I create a fan club where, you know, maybe I let the first thousand people in for free, I build up a reputation in the system of having the best fan club, but now the fan club's getting pretty full and I ratchet up the price to get in. So now as a user, I'm paying to join another tweeter's uh, fan club, and then they're turning around making all this cryptocurrency and they're saying, ooh, whose fan club can I join? And so that's what you're doing, you're building an economy around some way that consumers can provide value to other consumers where there's sort of like built-in scarcity. You know, I can only have so many people in my fan club. I'd love to give it to you all for free, but I can't. So who will pay me the most? And let's facilitate that with the cryptocurrency. The really cool thing about this is now as a digital service provider, as Twitter, your number one metric is how well can you get consumers compensated? Okay, before it was how well can we extract value from consumers. Now it's how well can we give value to consumers. And the more you do that, the more valuable the cryptocurrency will be. And the second cool thing is that person giving value to the ecosystem and getting compensated for it, no matter how much value they provide and no matter what country they live in, we can get them that value. Right? If you think about it, if we were trying to do this with US dollars, we're like, hey, this person provided 0 0.0001 US dollars worth of value, and they're in India. Let's mail them a check, right? Could never do it. But with cryptocurrency, no matter where you live, no matter how much value we pro you provide, we can get you that compensation. Uh, so I think that's really cool too. So guys, check it in on time. It's 8.30. This is obviously very engaging, and everybody wants to keep asking questions. But we have to be out by 8.45, I understand, right, Jesse? So maybe we break the and, landlord. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I think we can break and we can continue the discussion over whatever beer and pizzas left over there. So, um, but thanks again for everyone for coming and Michael for so much. hosting this recording. Thank you. Event. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ted.
Touch a hundred thousand souls None of them would ever